1984 Florida State football team gave Seminole fans a sneak preview of the young men who would face one of the toughest schedules in major college football. On picture day, no one could foresee the great triumphs and the heartbreaks that lay ahead in the 1984 season. An improved defense and a record-setting offense would take the Seminoles to yet another postseason bowl game. A motion filled Doak Campbell Stadium as Chief Osceola and Renegade kicked off another Seminole uprising. The 1984 Florida State highlight film is brought to you through the support of Sun Banks. Hopes were high as fans, coaches, and players set lofty goals for this new team. East Carolina was the first opponent, and the Knolls chose to begin their attack on the ground. Tied at three apiece, Cletus Jones picked up 20 yards. Rosie Snipes followed punishing blocking to give FSU a 10-3 lead. A reverse to Darren Holliman, a freshman, clicked for 13 yards and another score. On the ensuing kickoff, one of their own blockers caused a fumble, and number 99, Bruce Hagee, recovered. Two plays later, quarterback Eric Thomas found Hassan Jones in the end zone. It was 24-3 FSU. Not to be outdone, the defense and number eight, Eric Riley, intercepts. Eric Thomas wasted little time in connecting with Jesse Hester for a touchdown and a 31-3 lead. Heisman Trophy candidate Greg Allen hurtled in for six, and the Seminoles went on to crush East Carolina 48-17. In most colleges across America, some things never change. And so it was with FSU's explosive offense as it traveled to Lawrence, Kansas. Today's game against Kansas would be a clinic given by the Seminoles in all phases of the game. Number 47, Brian Williams, and number 58, Henry Taylor, began the lesson on sacking. Daryl Gray picked one off. Number 79, Gerald Nichols, got some help from his friends. And the new defense under Mickey Andrews looked conspicuously improved. The special teams, led by number five, Joe Wessel, did their job. And the defense, playing under new management, was showing early signs of dependability. Kansas did manage an early field goal, but Eric Thomas hit Hassan Jones to erase that lead, 7-3. to three. The offensive line opened gaping holes for FSU runners. Gray Gallon carried to the 50. Cletus Jones took it the rest of the way behind precision blocking by the entire front line. The nationally recognized Florida State offense was living up to its reputation. Greg Allen scored twice to make it 28 to 10 FSU. Kansas tried a new quarterback with the same results. Martin Mayhew picked this one off. The Seminoles simply outclassed the Jayhawks in a 42-16 win. You know. Head coach Bobby Bowden joked with Miami's Jimmy Johnson, but defending national champion Miami wasn't sure FSU could handle the faster track in South Florida. The Seminole faithful knew this would be the real test for Florida State's new defense. You know, we were really practicing hard. You know, Coach Bowden emphasized to the defense that we needed to put pressure on Kozar. Bobby Bowden called for pressure, and number 31, Billy Allen, delivered. 
The offense was to keep the ball away from Miami as long as they could. Eric Thomas and Jesse Hester connected on another big first down. Derek Schmidt made the Seminoles' first drive count with the longest field goal in FSU history, a 54-yarder. He added a 40-yarder on their next possession to give Florida State a 6-0 lead. In the meantime, All-American Bernie Kozar was running for his life. The old secondary blanketed Miami receivers, and the front four for Florida State were on fire. While Williams and Scott were burying Kozar, the offense was planning a patented Bobby Bowden surprise. Coach Bowden, he put the play in the week before, and we worked on it all week. So, you know, the situation presented itself. We were deep uh, about a 20 or uh, 30 yard line, and, you know, they had been giving us the reverse, the reverse, reverse. So we came back with the pass, and, you know, I came around, and Jesse, you know, he broke to the corner. I threw it out there, and Jesse, you know, he jumped up and caught it, and it was good for about 40 yards. The offense ground out another field goal to take a precarious 9 to nothing lead. Number 68, Lenny Chavers, forced a fumble, and number 58, Henry Taylor, recovered. The defense continued to challenge Miami, and number 17, Eric Williams, stole a sure first down. The interception gave Florida State a thin 9 to nothing lead at the half. We'd worked very hard for that nine points. We'd driven down and kicked a field goal, driven down and kicked another field goal, driven down and kicked another field goal. That's a very slow way to put nine points on the board. So at the half, we had about a third down and a 17, I think, or 12, and we were down our end of the field where we didn't want to risk turning the ball over, and we knew they'd be looking for a forward pass. So we ran the reverse, and Jesse uh, made the best run he's made since he's been in Florida State when he ran 77 yards for a touchdown. Eric Thomas faked a handoff, and Hester and Greg Allen crisscrossed in the backfield, confusing Miami defenders. The offensive line maintained their blocks, and Jesse Hester's God-given speed did the rest. Florida State's first possession of the second half, and it was a 77-yard touchdown run. The try for two was good, and it was 17 to nothing, Florida State. From the 26-yard line, play fake by Thomas. Thomas still has a ball, throws it downfield toward Hassan Jones. Touchdown of issue! That strike to Jones put Miami on their knees, and it was becoming a Tallahassee lashing. When Rosie Snipes took it in less than two minutes later for the final Seminole score, the lights went out for Miami. day, the Seminoles added South Florida to their domain. It was the defense's finest hour. Um, our defense just played a fantastic game, probably one of the greatest games I've ever seen, you know, in college football as far as playing against somebody of that caliber. For one, it was a total team effort. Offense played well, defense played great. I think we really came together in that game. Florida State was 3-0, and it destroyed the defending national champion. The excitement carried into the next game against a stubborn Temple University team. Temple met Joe Wessel. Every spring, we try to find a guy that has natural ability in blocking a punt. Bobby Butler with the Atlanta Falcons was a great punt blocker. Uh, uh, Hannah, uh, Warren Hannah was a good punt blocker for Florida State, but Joe Wessel has topped them all, and he is the slowest and the most likely of any punt blocker we've had here, and yet he was in on, he, he was, he's the best punt blocker probably the nation ever produced in college football up to this time. 
number five, Joe Wessel, began his special brand of havoc in the first quarter. John Eford recovered for FSU. That set up a 43-yard touchdown run by All-American Greg Allen. He leaves behind the records for most touchdowns scored, most yards gained, and highest average per carry. Although he missed most of the last four games, he remains Florida State's all-time leading rusher. Still in the first quarter, Joe Wessel smothered a field goal attempt. And number eight, Eric Riley picked it up and ran 34 yards for the score. That made it 14 to nothing, FSU. The defense was intimidating the school from Philadelphia and finally took the ball away from them. Thomas teamed with Jesse Hester and Hassan Jones for TDs and Florida State Mall Temple 44 to 27. The game was another showcase for number four, senior receiver Jesse Hester. He went on to lead the Seminoles in receiving in 1984 with 42 catches. Florida State tied Memphis State the following week and came home to fourth ranked Auburn. The Tigers took the lead 10 to 3. Eric Thomas hit Pete Patton to tie the game at 10. Auburn, however, came back with two more scores to open a 22 to 10 lead. Thomas went to the bomb, and Jesse Hester never changed stride. At 22 to 17, the stage turned sour on the Seminoles. On what may be the most bizarre play of the 1984 season, FSU kicked off and caused a fumble on the run back. In the pileup, the ball popped up into the hands of a surprised Auburn player who ran untouched for an easy touchdown. It was 29 to 17, and time to see if Florida State had the character to fight back. Darren Holloman on a reverse, followed key blocks and scored. The defense and Isaac Williams stayed tough. Eric Thomas hit Hassan Jones to take the lead, and the Seminoles made it 32 to 29 with a two-point conversion. Rosie Snipes picked up big chunks of yardage. Thomas again found Hassan Jones in the corner to go ahead 41 to 35. But Auburn scored with time running out to escape again by a whisker at a touch of good fortune. FSU buried Tulane the next week, 27 to 6. And a real live Western hero would be needed against Pac-10 power Arizona State in Tempe. 96 points were scored in this shootout in the desert. Arizona State plays to a 17 to nothing lead early. Greg Allen ran for 223 yards on just 10 carries. Kirk Coker replaced injured Eric Thomas at quarterback and threw for 203 yards and two touchdowns. But the Sun Devils kept pouring it on. Bobby Bowden called for the special teams and real help was on the way. Lenny Chambers blocked a punt, 
and number five, Joe Wessel, began his heroics. Joe Wessel broke Florida State and NCAA records with five blocked kicks and three returns for touchdowns in 1984. Joe Wessel's two returns for touchdowns carried the Knolls to a dramatic 52-44 win over Arizona State. The following week, FSU lost a heartbreaker to South Carolina and then shut out Tennessee Chattanooga 37 to nothing. Then got ready for arch rival Florida. They lined up for this one. For the Seminoles, it was their second national telecast in their last three games. The game was heard over the 70 station Seminole Sports Network. crowd saw a partly sunny pre-game show turn to swirling winds and an ugly dark sky. The sight of injured star running back Greg Allen in street clothes made the setting even more ominous. And the hand dealt the Seminoles on this dreary December day was as dark as the weather. Seminoles fought to overcome a 17-3 halftime deficit. But the Sunbank scoreboard knew the key to FSU's fate in 1984. The rain stopped, and Brian McCrary and Florida State came alive. The replacement for injured Greg Allen was number 49, Tony Smith, a junior who fought for 14 punishing yards. That run set up Eric Thomas's pass to freshman Pat Carter for a seminal touchdown. Kirk Coker hit Jesse Hester for another score, but it was too little, too late, as Florida won it 27 to 17. The loss did little to dampen the spirits of the Seminoles, who were bound for the Citrus Bowl. We were always looking forward to playing the University of Georgia, but we knew that they would never play us, and we would never go up to Stanford Stadium and play them. So being matched in the Citrus Bowl was uh, sort of a dream come true. A national TV audience saw Florida State face Georgia, a school they hadn't played in 20 years. Bobby Bowden saw his tribe fall behind again, this time 14 to nothing at the half. The defense was playing solid football. Fred Jones's sack inspired the offense. Eric Thomas hit Pat Carter for good yardage. Derek Schmidt kicked a field goal, and FSU entered the final period down 14 to three. From the two, Tony Smith scored. The two-point try was no good. Georgia kicked a field goal to lead it 17 to nine, and the defense took over. Henry Taylor flattened the Georgia runner, and Martin Mayhew recovered the fumble. A reverse to Jesse Hester put Florida State on the 50. Tony Smith to the 12.
the drive stall there, and it was time for the Joe Wessel and Lenny Chavers show. This time, Lenny blocked it, and Joe took it in. The critical two-point play to tie the game was too slick for cameramen to follow. The play went left after a tremendous fake right by Eric Thomas. Number 24, Darren Holloman tied it at 17. And Florida State had come back again from what seemed like sure defeat. The tie was a, a, a really a, an in, indicative of the way our team fought in, during the 1984 season. Our kids came back and fought like mad in the fourth quarter of every ball game and came back and tied that ball game and uh, when it looked like everything else was futile. We have a lot of people coming back, a lot of people that are, you know, have the attitude and have the desire to win, and so I'm looking for a real good year next year. Just got an uh, excellent year recruiting, 1983, and we think we're having a good year recruiting this year. So you just keep trying to put these things back to back and then get a little break in here somewhere where you get that extra little one point that you need, see? That's the only thing that's se separating us uh, from the top teams in the nation. We never quit. I think we fought every team to the end, to the last whistle, and I think that's the biggest thing that characterizes this team. Many of the players on this team that wouldn't quit are returning. The Seminoles were just four points shy of a 10-2 season in 84, and to many sports writers, Florida State may be the team to beat in 1985. On behalf of Florida State University, the football coaches, and the football team, we want to thank Sunbank for the great support they've given our Florida State football program, and especially for this FSU football highlight Sunbank film. Thank you.